I'm fully aware we're going a bit into the lunch break and um, justifying that means to bring the audience a bit into this conversation. So if we could have the lights on and for 15 minutes we'll have a bit of an interaction between maybe some of the questions you may have. Um, we have microphones roving around so raise your hand. Um, maybe there was a, a moment already where we got a lot of applause or Julia got a lot of applause for disagreeing with Joe and maybe there are a few people who actually really feel they want to say something about that particular point about either disciplining the architects or actually undisciplining the architects. But that's just one suggestion. Is there anyone who would like to say something? So I'll, I'll look here. No, no one. Over there, we have a gentleman, third row, fourth row. And we'll just collect a few comments, questions, Thank you. and then come back. Uh, I think it's a very interesting discussion and I, I would just refer back to the notion of the polymath uh, we heard about earlier today in this uh, bridge construction between the um, urbanism and architecture. I think maybe the best example of this uh, type of polymath is maybe the assemble example where you are a group of uh, not only architects because I think the problem with being let's say only an architect is that uh, if you have a hammer you usually see the nail as the problem and uh, I see a little bit that uh, in some of these project examples that are presented with the with the water and the, and the, the sewage that uh, it, it's to work in the urban uh, context I think the sewage system shows it quite well that in the end, maybe the most important part was the capacity building for the local people to administer these new systems themselves. So it was more an educational uh, than architectural, or more precisely, it was both. Okay, thank, thank you very much. There was uh, another person, the lady just in front, I believe, raising the hand, no? Okay, so then I'm there, right there, yes. And if you could please say who you are, thank you. Sorry? What's was if? Uh, ah, okay. I'm uh, Carla schulte fischelig from Berlin, um, and I was thinking about the last point, uh, what means um, the notion of home. I think I saw uh, about something about a project of, uh, I think, um, Austria, and they built up tents in the, in the building, because the main point, uh, what people need is intimacy, intimacy, sorry for my English, and also uh, the possibility for a quiet room. And I think that's a thing, it's important perhaps to think about it. Second point is, um, um, there is also an interesting film about how um, refugee camps are planned and uh, built up. And I think it would be important, if it's not the case for, for the moment, uh, to get in contact with these people, with all the rules they are working on, uh, to think about how it could deal with the architecture. If it's, uh, it's, I think the communication at this point uh, is very important. And the third point I was thinking about, it was I completely agree with you. I think, um, or I would even tell it uh, more strong, climate change is a very special situation, very urgent situation. I have been in Paris for the climate conference, and all people have to change their mind, uh, their profession, to see what they can do to change it, in my mind. so. Same. Thank you very much. We have uh, two more comments on this side, uh, one here, then over there. We'll return to the table and then yeah. I'll cover the other side. Is it good? Okay. Uh, my name is uh, Fondas Dielis Mas. I come from Athens, Greece. I would like to go back to the, um, to the matter of uh, the discipline and the role of architect. So I would like to make a remark and say that uh, it is very much affected, in my opinion, by the way that we architects are taught and the education we, talk, we took. And this education put us on top of a pyramid, like we're on top of everything, that every, people work for us and not with us. And I think that in this whole context that we're talking about, uh, this scheme is now turned from a pyramid into a circle, right? We're just one point of the circle, as equal and as important as others. So there, there's a, this, this question of ego for us architects, you know, we have to put our ego down in some way and try to operate in a different manner. And this is kind of difficult, I think, for many architects. It has to do with the question of authorship, of, authorship, of you know, the design, what is mine, what, is, what have I done, what have I contributed to the project, and all. So this is my remark. Okay, thank you. And the final one over there. Um, Third, sorry, right. I, I was thinking of the 
A man in the third row, gray hair, if I may point out. <laughs> My name is Marcello Balbo from the University of Venice. I want to thank uh, particularly the two last um, speakers uh, because they contributed to this issue of uh, refugees, but they didn't speak very much about migrants. And this, I think, uh, bridges to what we have been ta you have been talking about yesterday on the city. It seems to me that here, during these two days, the issue of migrants in terms of diverse cultures getting into the city has not been touched upon sufficiently. We've been talking about architects, urban planning, urban planners, but we have to, it seems to me, take into consideration the fact that the city of today, the contemporary city, is challenging us from the point of view of taking in diversities. So we need to reconsider our role, our capacity, uh, in order to uh, you know, take in the fact that diverse people, diverse cultures, public space, what is it public space today, what does it mean to the diverse people and the migrants in particular coming into the city. This dimension, it seems to me, that has to be taken up in a much more uh, precise way and taken into account. Thank you. Maybe, maybe we'll quickly take some reactions to this. I'll, I'll just quickly um, uh, recall what was said. Uh, there was an intervention that basically said that we're doing capacity building if we are uh, dealing with water and sanitation and so on and not architecture. Um, there was an intervention that talks about the ego of the architects and the fact that we need to, in a sense, uh, be a little more self-effacing possibly to be uh, effective. Uh, an intervention that reminds us about climate change being uh, a, a very big challenge and I think, again, recalling uh, Alejandro Aravena's uh, presentation. And then the, the fourth, uh, talking about diversity in public space and how we need to pay a lot more attention. I, I hope I, uh, I captured that. Would anyone want to quickly respond to these uh, four interventions or any one of them. <clears throat> Amika? Um, um, I'll respond really briefly to the disciplinary question, um, partly just because I'm very, um, I guess, uncomfortable with any reading of, of, of our projects as a way of, I guess, undermining the role of architecture. Um, so we do work in an interdisciplinary way, and the, but the thing which is important about that is, is helping to understand which of the complex set of problems that you encounter when you, when you start working in an area are ones which design can usefully interact with and, and usefully solve, and which ones you need other tactics for. But it, it's certainly true that in a lot of situations, design has a, has a really a really important, a very formative role to play, but I guess it's just about understanding the place that you intersect the problem um, from a slightly broader perspective. But I, I also think that's something that, that your presentation raised, also talking about building skills and modes of habitation. I mean, in a way, I cheated a bit, I guess. I mean, this is the panel of you know, solutions from below, and like we come up with the integration of uh, the solution from above. But I think one aspect which is really, um, I think I'm also very, or we are very interested in, is the scale of the neighborhood. And I think that is, you know, then automatically questions the discipline of the architect who is like things of a, uh, in the building scale. But if you think about a neighborhood, then we suddenly think about the beautification of uh, infrastructure or building trees. And I think, you know, this is uh, if architecture or in the scale of a neighborhood design is about enabling a community, then we should, you know, we as architects should much more think of uh, infrastructure as our design aspect. And I think very much in a three-dimensional way and because what you actually showed you said with your uh, with the sewage as it being installed the, the the buildings could rise from two level to a four level and I think you know we, we want to achieve density as well so I think this is should be our task much more than anything else um, any other oh, right. <coughs> please okay. no, I'd, I'd like to get back to that question of the one gentleman who spoke about the ego and all those other things that, you know, we know about the Ayn Rand and the Fountainhead. But I think we've got to understand that architecture is a social art. And it is an art. It's 
It is an art, but it's a social art. And I think the tussle that architects face all the time is that in the practice of art, you are autobiographical. You have to be. If you aren't, then you're not an artist. But we don't work like other artists because we're paid by people to do things for them. And those things are in the service of a wider community. And it's that tension that I think makes architecture so interesting. And I agree with you, some architects behave like artists without understanding the fact that it is a social art. But I think we can't escape. That's what I mean when I talk about disciplinary knowledge. We cannot escape from the fact that what we do is we practice a form of art. Don't escape that. Okay, we, okay. We, yeah. I want to take uh, three more comments. Keep it brief, say who you are, and then we can go back to the table once more. Please, Marcos. Is this working? Yeah. Uh, Marcos Rosa from Sao Paulo, Brazil. Um, I'd like just to stress on one point that I think has been a common um, thread throughout the presentations um, and was uh, pointed out in the very last one, which is how much are we actually open to the other and to listening and to learning in the process of designing. I think this has been a very important one. And then uh, we listen to the word reactive design. I think if we are um, uh, reactive, responsive, if we are in the environment listening to and trying to understand which the opportunities are, and then we are able to actually coexist and try to build it collectively, obviously the, the, the amount of work and the capacity of uh, impacting on the environment can only grow if we work with different disciplines, with different people, with different actors. I think this came out very uh, in lots of different colors in all of the presentations, and I think uh, we should question ourselves, Jesus Arctic. So, how much are we willing to listen to actually work with other groups, other people to actually build a collective indeed? Let's Thank you. Over there, yes, please. Hello. Uh, I'm Hassan Zaiter. I'm a Lebanese architect and a researcher at La Sapienza. I have a question about architecture. Why, why till now architecture is working usually as, pro, like architects are we are usually working as providers. We know now that 1% of the architects are working for, uh, for, for poor peop uh, for people. So why cannot, we cannot as architects and researchers and also scholars uh, like support these people and empower them to, to uh, like, uh, to improve their settlements. Why is these poor people always, they are like, we look to them like we are architects and we are designing for them, not empowering them. The second question is about uh, migrants and camps. Now camps are becoming homes because we have a lot of camps, for example, in my country, we have camps like from 60 or 70 years. Now they are, they, are, they were unreality, but now they are reality. So how can researchers empower these people to be integrated in the city is the researchers are enough for them, or we should like work with them? Why you usually look to them from top to down, uh, like improvement? Uh, not, we don't uh, like work with them. Thank you. Sorry, I uh, thought someone was right here. So let's go to this gentleman over there. And that's final comment from the audience. Hello, my name is Rainer Hehl. I'm uh, the collaborator of Joe Nuero for the Table House project. I, I want to talk about the role of the architect again, and today we realize again that we're just scratching the surface of um, the challenges we are facing in the world, and it's very complex. How can we face that as architects? How can we face the complexity? And I I uh, believe that um, it's really entropic if we, if we constantly extend our knowledge in saying the architect ha has also to be uh, a social mediator, the architect has also to be an infrastructure planner. And I want to emphasize the fact that we have to collaborate. Markus also talked about that. The intensity that we experienced in the project of the Table House is the uh, fact that we collaborated. We collaborated with social business uh, initiative, we collaborated with a local builder, we collaborated with an engineer. So in a certain way, it's not about just extending the discipline of architecture, but creating networks between the discipline of the architect and other disciplines. So what if we, instead of just extending the discipline, uh, intensify uh, the connections and the collaborations and folk 
by at the same time focusing what our uh, discipline can really have as an impact. Okay. Um, I'm afraid we can't take any more questions, so um, we'll subject these interventions to some discussion. Um, I'd like to, of course, uh, try and bring back politics into this. Uh, clearly, the redefinition or the re-redefinition of what the architect's main role is, whether it's collaboration, bringing together all of uh, the different elements, uh, seems to suggest a different kind of relationship to society. And um, would anybody want to... Uh, respond directly to the questions or perhaps take up this theme so we can close the session. Roxana. Okay, so um, what Rainer was saying, uh, um, intensi extended more than intensified, I, I, I agree in some part, but in the other I think that maybe there's a new discipline that we should look for, that it's not only the architect, but it's, it's a new, I don't know the name, we should maybe call a new name. Um, because even though that we tried to collaborate and we did collaborate with many actors, with the community, with the government, we still as architects had to do a lot of things that surpass our, our, yeah, our education or what we do, but we really had to do it. And so in the way that we have to take action, as I said before, and we have to do it, then how do we find new ways of doing that, um, that we really have to amplify what we do? You know, you, you mentioned politics and you also mentioned the role of the architect. And I think, and well done, Rain, I agree with you 100%. Um, I think that the problem with architectural practice today is that we operate in a vacuum without any kind of ethical framework to guide our actions. Um, and, and I'm not sure that one can develop an ethical framework for architectural action that everyone's going to buy into, but I think every architect should start to develop that. I, I'll give you an example. In our practice, we won't design a private house of larger than 150 square meters in area. And we won't do that because we argue there's a housing crisis in the world and that we need to have maximum standards rather than minimum standards. Similarly, we won't work for people, for example, who seek to use our labor only to maximize profit. That is commercial speculators. So in our way, in our small way, we make our own framework and that guides the work we do. And I think more architects need to do that because if we could do that, we would become much more useful in the world that we live in. Thank you, Joe. Um, so we'll have two final words. Joe has already given us one. Julia, yours is next, and then we'll close. Oh, oh no, someone else should speak after me. But um, I, what I just wanted to say is that the aggregate of individuals is often the opposite of community. So that community can be found in a hair salon or in a sewage system or in a you know, coffee bar, and that's what needs to be acknowledged. And so when I make a claim for a kind of it's not broadening the scope of the architect, it's broadening the scope of what constitutes architecture. Because why I think what we have a deficit in is an institutional deficit. So for example, architects have been written out of the delivery of housing in the United Kingdom. We've become, by white papers in our government, a sort of look and feel practice. And, and, and that's it's almost a call to come back and to shape the institutions that are involved in the delivery of the very things that we're meant to design. Um, and so it's not a call for becoming engineers or social workers. Um, and I'll leave, yeah. So. Thank you. Thank you, Julia, for those words. Um, I think with that, we'll close an extremely stimulating and engaging discussion. Um, we should stay with what came out of this discussion as we go into the next one, post-lunch, um, when we talk about uh, solutions from above.